So, well, as many of you might know, I come from Spain. So, hello, my name is Inigo Montoya. You killed my father, now prepare to die. And, uh, no, actually, I'm Francisco Izquierdo, a uh, clone -like. And I'm going to talk about uh, how I managed to break Petia Cypher using pen and paper. Uh, I should make an important note here. Petia Cypher was broken when I started. I just was trying to find why. We have a gift for you. Oh, thank you. And now you can suffer my math. <laughs> <laughs> cool. So, uh, I, I'm, I'm going to make a promise to you before I start with this talk. I will not use the word big likes or fuck, uh, except for this phrase, obviously. And I will not talk about advanced, ultra complex mathematical concepts. I'm going to try to make it simple. So, if at any point of the talk you guys see that uh, this is getting too complex, you raise your hand and I will try to slow down. Okay? Nice. So, well, sort about me. I have been working with security since I was 17. I'm a computer engineer. I also have a Master's of Science at Salmers. I'm a N2 hardened developer, like that other guy over there. Uh, I also work with cryptography. I do it mostly for fun. Uh, I did some implementation of ISCP in Atmega, so I could run it on the bootloader and do all this cool stuff of having cryptographically signed uh, bootloader updates. Uh, then I also implemented CTR, CMAX, some that's a strange uh, cryptographic stuff in, Has in the Haskell cryptographic library. I have wrote NTTH uh, in C, and I tried to, to write it also in OpenCL. I suppose many of you being from Sweden know the Direct Connect Network. Uh, ADC is the new version of the Direct Connect Network. And well, currently I'm working as a pen tester and providing cryptographic support at this company called Corsex Systems AB. So I'm going to give you a fast and simple introduction about what is this crypto stuff. Uh, mostly a good cipher will have two properties. One of them is called confusion. Basically, it means that you try to hide the relationship between the original text and the resulting text that you are going to send. Then you also have diffusion, which means that you will try to affect all the bits of the output text with all, uh, with all the bits of the input text. So if one bit of the input text changes, half of the bits of the output text change. These two are very important because it's what, we, what I actually use to analyze Petia cipher. Then a stream cipher, as opposite to a block cipher, is basically a cipher that will produce a stream that you merge up with the plain text. Salsa 20 is actually a stream cipher. It picks a known state, then makes an operation called XOR with the plain text to generate the cipher text. And Salsa 20 is a derivative of Salsa 20, and it's used nowadays for SSH and also for TLS. So far, so good? Cool. So here is the backstory, what happened. Uh, Petia was published somewhere in March, if I recall correctly. It was the first ransomware that, work, that worked and encrypted your hard drive from the boot sector. Actually, it didn't encrypt the full hard drive. As Hassel Sade pointed out, uh, it encrypted only, only some parts of the hard drive that were needed by the operating system in order to find where the files were. So your files were left unencrypted but without information of where the file started and where the file ended and how it was distributed across the hard drive, you basically were fucked up. So, well, there was this guy, Leo Stone, who, whose father's laptop got encrypted, and we got a really cool history. You know, uh, my father's laptop gets encrypted. I go over holidays. My father asks, how the fuck do I fix this? A uh, guy manages to first discover a flaw in the keying system, so he tries a brute force attack, realizes that it's too slow, so he then tries to implement a genetic search algorithm, and it turns out that it works. So, well, Petia uses a Salsa 20-like cipher. Uh, the fact that it was broken using genetic algorithms is really bad because it means that the confusion of the cipher, that is the relationship between the plain text and the cipher text, is quite clear. I mean, you cannot infer how they relate to each other, but there is some kind of relationship that you can use a genetic algorithm in order to figure out and find the original key. And the question is, 
Well, is this only a Petya thing? Is a Salsa 20 thing? If it's a Salsa 20 thing, it's also affecting Salsa 20, and maybe we need to change ciphers again, like we did with RC4. And well, here are the constraints. Uh, this was done on my spare time. I used my own tools. And you know, programming on a bus doesn't work, so I used pen and paper because it was much easier in my case. So, well, first thing I tried, I was a stupid. I tried the algebraic approach. That is basically, I pick the whole cipher. I model it as a lot of equations. Uh, for example, the additions can be made as a group of XORs, ANDs, and ORs, as you can see. That is a single bit ad uh, other. You pick 32 of them or 16 of them in the case of Petya because it uses 16, feet, 16 bit words. And then you model that into an equation, and there you go. You have an addition. Then you have a rotation, which is just remap, remapping the bits. And an XOR is obviously an XOR of the bits. Uh, well, things got awfully complicated soon, so that was a total fail. <laughs> so I said, OK, I'm going to try something different. I'm going to focus on especially diffusion, but also on the confusion. How do inputs contribute to outputs? Are there particularly weak parts of the output? And, well, that will give me an heuristic of words, or if I did it bit per bit, of bits, which has the less contributions on which I can focus my hacking efforts. So, well, this is basically how my paper looked it up when I started with that. Uh, you can see that it doesn't fare well, because suddenly you start getting a lot of contributors. And I'm going to explain you how this works. So this is before the first run. Uh, we have that every word only contributes to itself. So then this is after the first quarter round. Basically, we have an addition of words 0 and 12. And then we make a rotation, seven, seven bits to the left of the addition. And then we XOR that result on word number four. So as a result, as you can see, Word number four now has contributions from words 0, 4, and 12. So this is after the first quarter round. You can see that the rest of the words on the quarter round get contributions from 0, 4, 8, and 12. And after the first round, you can see that basically all the words get between three and four contributors. This is after the first column quarter round. You can see that the contributors are increasing only for the first column. Uh, this is after the first column round, and well, basically after the second round, it was totally fucked up. So yeah, that escalated fast, and it didn't work. <laughs> so OK, we go back to the design board. Uh, we see there is a lot of type casting going on. I mean, why do they make the addition, then make a 32-bit in, in unsigned integer, then they rotate it, and then make it back a 16-bit integer? That's odd, at least. So that raises some questions. What is the type of addition? I mean, of course, if the, if the addition is made using signet integers, then we will have to take care of signet of sign bits. If the addition is made with signet integers, then we know that it will be used zero expanded. Uh, yeah, in the cast are the sign bits expanded, and well, is the rotation the only? Why is the only 32-bit operations? And well, the truth is that the kid, <laughs> the king, had been naked the whole time. I mean. Uh, the additions return the same type, which is 16 bytes, 16 bits un unsigned integers. Uh, so as a result of that, we do a zero expansion, then we rotate. Uh, so the zeros that we had at the back go to the beginning. And uh, well, zero XOR whatever value is that value itself. So the value is left to modify it. So yeah, rotations make that we have bits in our words that are not modified. And this is how I did it with paper. Uh, basically, you can see that, uh, well, you have the zeros at both sides representing the rotation. You have the additions. And I was like, OK, I have nine bits plus seven zeros. In other cases, I have seven bits plus nine zeros. Then I have three bits plus 13 zeros. Then 14 zeros plus two bits. Because there was four types of rotations. Uh, of them, three were left rotations. One of them was a right rotation. So now I can answer you one question. Why did they use 32-bit rotations? Because it turns out that the rotation constants in SASA 20 are some of them larger than 16 bits. So you need to cast a word to 32 bits or modify the rotation constants. And they decided to, to, to take the 
oh my god, bad approach. So, okay, the first attempt, as you saw, there is the smallest rotation we do to the left is seven bits. The only rotation we do to the right is two bits. Okay, there is five bits that are not going to be modified. It's because we will have bits modified by right rotation, bits modified by right rotation. It's better if I write this one. So, the two bytes, the two bits to the right will be modified by the right rotation. Then we will get five bits that will not modify it. And then we will get, well, blah, 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 enough bits modified by the rotations made to the left. So, well, that reduces the entropy to 176 bits out of 256, which is obviously not good enough. I mean, there is no way you can brute force that. So I said, okay, let's try to focus on the unmodified bits. That is, which bits are not receiving any other contribution at all? And let's find the, the bits that are not tainted by other words. So at the beginning, we start just by having all the bits marked as untainted. So then we run the first uh, rotation, and we can see that after the first quarter round, bits 0 to, to 6 in word number 4 are left untainted. After the first full round, we will see that the first two bits of word number 0 are tainted, but the rest are left untouched. Uh, we will also see that the first seven bits obviously are left untouched. Then the first nine bits on word 8 are left untouched. And the first uh, 12, uh, no, 13 bits on word number 12 are left untouched. We run this algorithm again for the full first round. Then we do it for the second round. And basically, for every, every other round, you will get the same results because it's basically repeating the same rotations again and again and again. So, well, we can see that there is a lot of unmodified bits. I mean, in some cases, we only get two, unmodified, uh, two bits that are modified. And at the very least, we get seven bits. So yeah, that's actually a success in itself. But the state entropy gets reduced to 108 bits. So nope, we are still not good enough. So that brings another question. How are the state elements mapped? I mean, obviously, out of those 108 bits, there might be constants, there might be values that we already know, like the counter. So there was this comment in the code uh, that really helped me. So if Leo and Stone is listening to this talk, thank you, you saved my life. And it explains how the different parts of the message map to the different constants, k values. Uh, well, he used the word nouns. Uh, this means a number that is used only a single time. Uh, then we also have the counter, which is a 32-bit unsigned integer. And well, this is the same, but with the values mapped. So we can see that actually there is only some parts of the key inside there. And as a result of that, we have only 68 bits, which is still not good enough. I mean, 68 bits will take a really long time to crack, even if we had a good machine. It took around three days for this, which is 48 bits. So multiply that by around, uh, let's see, 48, 16, it's uh, 65,000 times. So that's a really long period. OK, so that still left some questions. I mean, how is the state com combined with the plain text? Well, it's a plain XOR. We use pick the state of the, of the res uh, we pick the result of the SASA 20 operation. We XOR it with our uh, string. And then we have our encrypted string. How is the passphrase expanded? Well, we have that uh, strange thing there. Basically, it means that uh, we do a left shift of the value for the first eight bits of the word. Then the lower eight bits of the word are basically the letter with the set letter, uh, which is, uh, I think it's 67 ASCII value uh, added to it, which are valid key inputs. Well, one, two, three, four, basically digits, some under, some, uh, what's it called, lowercase letters, and some uppercase letters. And how are K expansions mapped to keys? And here comes the important thing. Letter zero is mapped to K zero, letter two is mapped to K one, but letter one is not mapped anywhere. So letters one, three, five, etc., are totally ignored by the algorithm. 
So here we have the thing mapped. I mean, we can see that actually leather zero has at least seven bits that are not modified. Leather two has nine bits that are not modified after expansion. So, well, we have seven bits, maybe even nine, that are not modified. The plain text we already know is basically a full string made of 0x37, which is the ASCII value for the character 7. Uh, so can we infer the value of the original key if we have the last eight bits? Yes, we can. I mean, it's really simple, since we already know that the last eight bits of the key is set added to our, uh, our letter. We will just get the last eight bits of our plain text that are unmodified. Then we will remove the plain text, which is 0x37. Then we will subtract 0x7a, which is the set character. And then we just, for the sake of safety, uh, make the modulo, the modulo operation again and get only the last eight bits of our result. Uh, but the question is, will this work if we use seven characters? And it turns out that, yes, it actually does, because basically no valid input character has the most significant bit set. So as a result of that, we can use cut to the seven characters, discard whichever value we get on the, on the eighth bit, and we will get back a, the original character that was used for encrypting our hard drive. So as a result of this, we have this really cool, fancy equation that nobody will like. Uh, I will try to explain it. Basically, it means that uh, we pick the, cipher, uh, the uh, encrypted text, then we XOR the ASCII character 7, and then we subtract the set letter, and then we just make the modulo operation, so that means extracting the last seven bits, which are the bits that were used on the key. And uh, we can actually use the equation to map words of cipher text to, to the parts uh, of the input key that were used. And we can just drop whatever is not used or just put any other character that is valid. So actually, that means that we can break Petya with a single plain text, and that's a flawless victory. But it's not just that. We, there was people around Twitter and so that said, hey, I actually managed to delete the Petya bootloader so can I still recover my data? Well, if you are willing to invest the effort, you can actually brute force the lost nonsense. So that's yet another flawless victory. But the real question here is, is Salsa20 broken? No. Salsa20 is still perfectly fine to use. Why? Well, first of all, Salsa20 has no passphrase mapping or anything like that. So that issue is totally out of the box. And well, Salsa20 uses 32-bit words everywhere. So there is no rotation flow happening on. If somebody decided to use, make the, the words 64 bits and they do the rotation, then of course you could have a flow. But that's obviously not the case of the original implementation, and it's not the case of reference implementation. So what happened? Well, it turns out that the developers released a new version that had stronger ciphers. It was fixed. But the uh, passphrase map mapping was still broken, so Hasser Sade published the reverse engineered code, then Procras broke it. So that could be maybe the beta, because it was harder to crack. And then they released the release candidate, you could say, which apparently has some much better passphrase mapping, and it hasn't been cracked. And if anybody is going to ask me why I haven't tried it, uh, mostly because I suck at reverse engineering, so I'm not going to try to figure out what kind of hashes are going around. So, well, what you should take home here is that first, Salsa20, it's still safe. I mean, there is no problem with it. Uh, Alt spe specific implementations, though, might not be. I told you, there is this example. If we cast the word to a 64-bit word and then apply the rotation, then that will be totally broken. Uh, especially, I want to show you, cryptanalysis is not about advanced mathematics. Uh, I think I have some time left, so I will try to show you how you can actually do this algorithm thing by yourself. And, well, the contributor's measurement, which you will find on the paper, and it's the technique that we used first, uh, that is actually reasonably fast. I mean, it only requires 
the square of the number of bits that you are using in the state, and it only requires number of bits times number of steps, so that's actually quite fast. The modified bit uh, measurement is even faster. So you can actually try to implement that if you are writing your own algorithm to make sure that it's not totally screwed up. Uh, so yeah, and as a last site, I wanted to use, take some time to thank a lot of people. I mean, first of all, of course, Leo and Stone, because if he hadn't published his work and his really nice genetic algorithms approach to break Spetia, I would never have been able to analyze what was going on. Uh, well, of course, my parents. Uh, hello, mom, I hope you are seeing me. <laughs> Uh, the safety organizers, which are around there, I cannot see them from up here, but yeah. Well, they deserve a round of applause, please, because they are arranging a really nice conference so far. <laughs> well, then also the guys that supported me during the research. Uh, it's hard to get all the names here, so you will have to just say, yeah, everybody. <laughs> Uh, then when I was preparing this, I got some really nice uh, input. Uh, there was this guy who sci fi he is not a security guy, but he helped me proofread the wall material that I prepared. That's the worst part of the work. Uh, then there is also Meredith Patterson, who is not here, but helped me a lot with telling me, yeah, you should expect this kind of people at SECTI, this is good, this is bad, prepare the talk in this way. Hasera said, which provided me a lot of input about Petya, how the, what was the history, who is behind the malware. Then Tero Haninen, which is sadly not here, but he was the guy that was, well, listening to me while I was complaining, like, yeah, I'm reducing the entropy using this kind of algorithm to do this, that, 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 that. The poor guy was really, really sad, but two days, so <laughs> I want to think that I didn't contribute to him leave the company. <laughs> Uh, then Niklas Anderson, who is over there, who also provided some input about the slides. And Mikael Johansson, which I don't think is here, but also provided some input and told me that I needed to, to make this a little bit easier to understand. And well, then my employer helped me. They gave me a place to just practice these things, so now I know which is the timing I have. I can make it slower or, ha or faster. And especially to you, because, well, it would be quite, quite pointless to do research if I couldn't share it with you so you can use it later. So, well, I'm going to go back and I'm going to try to show you how, how to use actually these ciphers, unless anybody has any fast question, which doesn't seem to be the case. And even if it was, it's not planned, so just come to me on the pause. <laughs> okay, so let's see, this should be the, uh, this slide here. Yeah, so first we are going to do the modified bits. This is a really simple thing. We are going to do it only for some of the words. But basically, we can do for word zero, we have bits zero to 15. For word, word one, zero to 15. For word two, zero to 15. For word three, zero to 15. That's basically what you saw on the notes when I was doing the shifting stuff and so on. So as you can see, first we got a word U, which is totally tainted because it has contributions from two different words. Then we apply the rotation, as a, and as a result of, of the rotation, we will see that the last seven bits are totally modified. So we will start with words 0 to 15. So we will have like 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, etc. And we will say, OK, so since the lowest seven bits are modified, we will start like on bit number 7. So 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. That's simple, isn't it? Cool. The contributor analysis works in a more or less similar way. I mean, basically, you start having word zero contributing with contributors being only. Are you sure this is not a permanent pen? No, it isn't. <laughs> OK. Uh, so you have here word zero. Word zero has contributor zero. Word one only is contributed by word one for now. Word two, word three, and word four. So in this case, for word 4, we can say, OK, word 4 is getting contributions from 0 and 12. So 0 and 12 get added to our list. Or you can just have all of them and start crossing them, if you prefer. I mean, there is people who is masochist, there is people who do sudokus. So for the second one, we will have like, OK, word 8, which will start with word 8 only. So we will see that we have contributions from word number four and word number zero. So we go to our table and see, 
Okay, we have these four, uh, sorry, these three contributions from word number four, and this contribution from no, word number zero. So we have to merge them. Uh, so it will be four zero zero twelve. So four zero twelve, and add them. So we will have four zero and twelve here, and we can repeat the process for every single word or for every single bit if we want. And with that, we will manage to find out these same flaws and. Well, that's it. I mean, hopefully this will be useful for you guys if in your day-to-day -day work, and you will try and you will be able to see if the really cool, fancy new cipher some engineer or some guy is putting in front of you is actually safe or not. So thank you a lot. <laughs> <laughs>